Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Franka Tamaris, and I'm the Events Coordinator at the Melbourne Energy Institute. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that today we are gathered on the lands of the Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung and Boon people who have been custodians of this land for thousands of years, and we acknowledge and pay our respects to Elders past and present. Thank you all for joining us today for the EMO Quarterly Energy Dynamics Report for Quarter 3 sorry, quarter four, 2023. Some housekeeping, uh, all questions must be submitted through the Q&A option on the menu as a chat function is disabled. We will have some time for questions during the session and at the end of the session also. And we will endeavor to get through as many questions as we can. Now to introduce our speaker for today, Mr. Kevin Lai, Group Manager, Reform, Development and Insights at AMO. His role covers many aspects of energy markets, including market design, policy and regulation, working with the Energy Security Board, the Australian Energy Market Commission, and the Australian Energy Regulator on market reform. Kevin is also responsible for the development and publication of the quarterly Energy Dynamics Report. Today's moderator is Dr. Sleeman Mahana, Research Fellow uh, Senior Research Fellow, Integrated Energy Systems, Electrical and Electronic Engineering at the University of Melbourne. Thank you again for joining us today. And now over to you, Kevin. Thanks, uh, Franca. Um, so if, today we'll go through the um, quarterly energy dynamics for um, previous quarter, uh, quarter four in 2023. So what we'll cover today is uh, wholesale electricity prices and demand. Uh, we'll look at some of the price setting dynamics um, last quarter, including uh, prevalence of uh, negative prices. Then we'll move on to electricity um, generation, interconnector flows and uh, frequency control and ciliary services outcomes. Uh, and then we'll finish off with uh, East Coast uh, gas market uh, observations. So what, what we saw in terms of demand changes, um, the underlying demand increased 3.7% uh, to an average of 23,178 megawatts in quarter four uh, last year. And that's the highest uh, underlying demand uh, on average since uh, uh, 2009. And this was uh, primarily driven by warmer uh, than average weather conditions in New South Wales and Queensland. We saw distributed PV output um, at 3,433 megawatts on average, uh, which is 17% higher than the last uh, quarter four, uh, 2022. And it's a new record for, for, for four quarter four quarter. Queensland and New South Wales, as I mentioned, um, had higher demands. Uh, that's because the the average maximum temperature temperatures uh, were higher uh, than the previous corresponding year, and in fact, high, high, higher than the uh, ten year average. And we saw um, regional operational demand. Um, for Queensland sitting at about 6,137 megawatts, New South Wales sitting at 7,037 megawatts, Victoria at 4,336 4, megawatts, which is an all-time low, and South Australia at uh, 1,089 megawatts, which is also an all-time low, and Tassie at 1,117 megawatts. In terms of demand records, um, the minimum demand records fell for New South Wales, Victoria, and South Australia. Um, and and um, and in terms of um, South Australia, um, it actually had a, a negative. Um, operational demand. Uh, basically, South Australian uh, region was generating more than 
uh, the requirements in South Australia. And uh, that extra 26 megawatts um, was exported uh, into, into Victoria. Um, in terms of this chart on the right-hand side is the uh, instantaneous um, uh, distributed PV um, maximum output. And it reached a record of uh, 51.3%. 50, and that occurred on the 29th of October. Um, in terms of wholesale electricity prices, um, there was a 48% uh, decrease in wholesale energy prices. Um, so the average price across uh, the NEM for the quarter was $48 per megawatt hour. And uh, that, that's come down, like I mentioned, 48% compared to last year. In terms of um, the makeup of, of the wholesale prices, um, these dark bars on the right show the e energy component. And basically that's prices below $300 per megawatt hour. And you can see the the energy um, component um, is um, is large. Uh, these these hash um, curves uh, above the bars uh, are the volatility component. So prices above uh, thirty dollars, prices above three hundred dollars per megawatt hour. So they they do contribute to the overall um, uh, price outcome, uh, but uh, occurrences of prices above 300 uh, are quite quite small compared to, to the energy component. And uh, this graph shows comparison of, of the uh, prices um, for quarter four last year compared to the previous quarter, quarter three, uh, and the red bar is quarter four, uh, 2022. In terms of um, in terms of the price setting dynamics, um, this top bar shows the marginal price setter uh, for last year in 2022, and uh, this bottom bar shows um, when the uh, what were the marginal prices, the average marginal prices uh, when different technologies uh, set uh, set the price. So you can see, you can see that, um, for instance, when black coal uh, set the price in 2022, um, that marginal price was uh, $113. Um, in the last quarter, when black coal set, set the price, that was much lower uh, at uh, $58 per megawatt hour. And black coal, set the price, the marginal price, 30% of the time. This, um, this observation and trend uh, was uh, across the board uh, for uh, all uh, technologies. And what's uh, interesting is um, the percentage of time the utilities scale battery sets the price has, has doubled. So it's gone from 1% to 2%, which is quite, quite, quite significant. Uh, absolute terms, it's more, but in, in rel relative terms, it's uh, significant. Now, with um, black hole generation, um, what we notice is uh, quite a large, large uh, shift in um, their offer curve. So this purple curve on the right um, shows for prices below $100 um, in 2022, 9,000 megawatts were offered. The same offer curve at $100 or less, you now have uh, 10,300 megawatts uh, being offered. So an additional 1,382 megawatts of um, offered capacity for prices below 
uh, $100. So I'll break for Q and A. So um, uh, Slayman, uh, is is there any any questions? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Uh, would you like me to continue with the presentation, or just give people a minute to? Uh, maybe give yeah. Let's give people a minute. Maybe they can write their their questions in the Q and A section. So, guys, if you have any questions so far, please write them down. All right, we have we have a question from Damon. So Damon's asking, was your graph showing that wind and solar typically set negative prices? Yeah, that's that's the uh, that's the case. Um, so when when wind and solar are the marginal generators. Um, the previous slide that I showed, um, wind would set the price at negative forty-seven dollars per megawatt hour, and solar, uh, when they are the marginal generator, um, they set the price at negative thirty-five dollars per, per megawatt hour. We have another question. Uh, Surya is asking about how about GRE in twenty twenty-three. VRE. Um, and, and, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, VRE is generically um, wind, hydro, uh, and solar, and uh, distributed uh, distributed PV. So that uh, that price setting dynamics slide uh, would have would have what what was the marginal price. Uh, when those technologies um, set set the marginal price. And we have another question that, that um, from Rod. He's asking, hydro was marginal around 35% of the time in both years and half the price in 2023. Is yeah. this just them making the most of the opportunity of higher prices? So that's the question. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so... Uh, with hydro, you know, that's that's uh, the hydro assets in Tasmania, the hydro assets in the snowy region, um, hydro assets in in Victoria, um, and then you've got the um, Korea and Barren Gorge um, stations in North Queensland. So each each one of those hydros would have slightly different drivers and, and incentives um, but my, my guess is um, the the slide before we showed that the wholesale energy price is 48% uh, less than compared to um, quarter four 2022 so hydro some of them are, uh, uh, are energy constrained so they can't generate the output all the time they have to look at the opportunity costs of, of generating that limited um, amount of water. So with with prices um, being um, being high, you would expect them to generate more. Um, and conversely, with prices low, uh, you would expect them to, to set, set the price lower. Uh, so that 
probably contributes to the difference in output uh, be, be, between the two years. And because um, some of the gener um, hydros are price takers because they're, they're, they're run of the river, um, that means they have to release a certain amount and generate a certain amount. So whatever the prevailing price is, uh, they're, they're, they're price taking that. So that's why you see uh, a, also a difference between the price outcomes, $126 versus $71. Thanks, uh, thanks for Kevin for this. Um, Jay is asking: Seems that grid solar price setting increased significantly from six to ten percent. Is this just commensurate with increasing solar capacity, or any other drivers? <clears throat> yeah, we'll have a chart later that shows um, the generation mix has increased. Um, with um, increased output from from uh, solar and from wind, um, so that somewhat explains uh, that uh, grid solar uh, is setting the price uh, more than they did compared to uh, one year ago. We have one final question from Julian. So Julian is asking, uh, not just hydro, every form of generation has been setting price significantly lower than a year ago. What is driving that? Yeah, um, it's supply and demand, basically. Um, so you've, you've, you've got... Um, You've got more more competition from uh, increases in in wind and solar, and then you've got uh, lower fuel costs. So um, thermal coal costs have come down, and also gas costs have come down. So those two factors means that um, overall. Um, there's more uh, reasonably su uh, price supply available uh, to meet to meet demand. So that's why we're seeing um, consistent with lower overall spot prices in the wholesale market. Um, those technologies, when they are the marginal price setter, are still setting price, but much lower than they were uh, one year ago. Thanks, Kevin. We have one more question that just came in. Uh, Nick is asking, regarding Victorian minimum demand, same minimum generation fell year on year by a similar amount and no brown coal plants uh, retired and no new transmission was added. What would happen? So the question is, what would happen if uh, when brown coal plants are hitting minimum generation and, and uh, these are getting retired now? Um, presumably, someone will need to start curtailing rooftop PV in about a year's time. So, um, that's the question. Yeah, um, it's 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 a good question. Um, you would think that the brown coal generators, like like any other generator, will be uh, commercially um, driven. So, so long as they can, they can make their uh, uh, return on uh, their, their variable costs, then you think that they have an incentive to uh, stay on and generate. And, but uh, it does make operating system uh, more difficult because um, uh, as the um, uh, as the uh, person pointed out, uh, when you have min minimum demands, some of those less less fle flexible generation may need to back off. 
and they, they may not be flexible enough to, to back off. Um, so it does make um, running the system securely and reliably more, more difficult. I think this was the last uh, question. Thanks, Kevin, for answering that one. Um, I believe we can we can go ahead and, and continue with the rest of the slides. Okay, thank you. Do you see my slides? Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll move on to talking about uh, electricity generation, uh, interconnector flows and um, FCAS outcomes. So this is quite a busy slide, but um, we saw NEM generation uh, increase 3.5% uh, um, compared to, to uh, 2022. Um, and lower uh, pricing outcomes and an increase in VRE uh, meant that uh, there was a reduction in coal and, and, and gas during the day and a reduction in hydro uh, at all times of the day. What's interesting is um, battery capacity. Uh, we, we saw an um, a, a increase in generation uh, in the evening hours from 1800 to 2100. And you can see that in this uh, purple purple uh, sliver, that's the battery uh, contribution. And going to my points uh, earlier, you can see from this uh, supply mix contribution by fuel fuel type, you can see uh, the the increases uh, percentage increases of uh, the uh, VRE type generation. So they're all quite significant compared to a year ago, 13 to 13.4% to 0.2%. Uh, and the corresponding reduction is from the thermal um, generation in black coal, brown coal, and gas. So uh, as a result of this um, change in uh, fuel mix, the uh, the emissions for the NEM reach an, uh, an all-time record of uh, 25.4 uh, million tonnes CO2 equivalent uh, or 0.59 uh, CO2 equivalent per megawatt hour uh, as a intensity number. And this chart on the on the right just breaks down the uh, the, the, the different um, teardrop type uh, changes uh, with the uh, uh, generation types. In terms of uh, black hole availability and output, let me go to that. Um, so couple of noticeable observations. So black coal generation recorded an all-time low uh, with an average output of uh, 9,189 megawatts. And you can see this curve on the on the right. Uh, that's a very clear visible trend in, in terms of uh, de declining output uh, for, for black coal generation. Liddell uh, power station closed last year, um, around about April from memory. Uh, but that that output was offset by the by uh, in, increasing uh, black coal generation. So there was only a net reduction in black coal generation of um, 30, 30 megawatts overall. These bar charts on the bottom uh, just show the um, um, the capacity uh, outages. Um, so you can see uh, planned outages have come down in New South Wales, 
1800 compared to 1024 megawatts and um, unplanned outage, outages um, have, have decreased. Um, you've got a similar situation with Queensland Black Coal. Planned outages have decreased, but uh, a bit more uh, unplanned force outages. And uh, in terms of availability, um, you can see from this chart that um, availability uh, of all black hole generation in New South Wales and Queensland has remained fairly st steady at, at around that uh, 5,600 to 6,000 uh, mark. So in terms of brown coal output, um, so there was a slight reduction in, in the average generation um, compared to last year. So 3,370 compared to 3,306 megawatts. Um, and a few more statistics on availability. And uh, we did see uh, quite a noticeable uh, drop in uh, available um, generation from uh, from Luoyang A. What's interesting is with brown coal, how much intraday um, change in generation uh, we, we are seeing. So it's quite a large uh, intraday swing. Um, ranging from 937 megawatts to uh, 1,251 megawatts, and that that can be seen from this this bottom curve here, where you can see um, that swing uh, is depicted by the, the duck curve anyway. And you can see um, around about midday in um, 2023. Uh, brown coal output on average is about 2,500. And then that, that increases throughout the day to the evening peak to about uh, 3,700 megawatts. So it's quite quite a large swing um, in, in output for, uh, for brown coal gen generation uh, in, in a space of uh, six hours. In terms of wind and solar output, uh, as, as I mentioned um, earlier, uh, we saw uh, grid scale VRE average output increase to an all time record of uh, 5,168 megawatts. And that's, that's driven by um, primarily by wind and solar. So you got solar. Uh, increasing from 1600 to 2000 megawatts and then wind from uh, 2800 um, to 3100 uh, in the space of one year those uh, the spread of that uh, new generation um, is uh, across the board so in New South Wales, you can see quite a large uh, contribution uh, from, from solar. Uh, similarly with Queensland, uh, 100, 163 megawatt increase compared to the previous year. And Victoria uh, contributed um, with uh, 149 uh, megawatts. So this slide on the um, right just uh, breaks that down uh, in a bit more detail uh, between wind and solar and uh, existing and new capacity and also um, capacity that's being commissioned and, and, and slowly ramping up to full output. Um, in terms of overall renewable output, this last quarter uh, reached a record of 72.1% uh, 
uh, instantaneous half hour output uh, was supplied from uh, VRE uh, generation. Uh, th th that is a record. And that occurred on the 24th October uh, last year. So the record included 41% uh, contribution from distributed PVs, uh, which are the rooftop PV PVs in the residential and commercial areas, 12% from wind and 17% 17 from uh, grid scale solar. In terms of uh, renewable renewables contribution to uh, daily uh, maximum operational demand, that reached a high also of 29.9%. And that can be seen in this curve on the bottom uh, where the contribution of uh, VRE um, relative to the um, maximum operational demand for the day is, is increasing. Okay, moving on to uh, gas and hydro output, um, you can see that gas uh, had had its lowest average output since uh, the year 2000 uh, at only 851 uh, megawatts. And um, hydro output also dropped um, by about 200 megawatts. And uh, generation from wind, uh, from uh, gas and hydro uh, pretty much fell across all regions with the exception of Queensland where you had uh, increased hydro output. So these curves um, just show uh, in a bit more detail um, where, where the uh, gas generation um, is segmented by regions. And similarly, where the hydro generation is um, cemented by by regions. And this curve on the bottom just shows that uh, hydro output in Queensland um, had it was observed to increase um, output relative to 2022 uh, during the uh, evening hours. In terms of uh, interregional uh, transfers and sediment residues, um, it's quite quite a busy slide. Um, so the left chart shows the quarterly regional price uh, in each region, and the quarterly average net flows between regions and direction by, via the green arrows. Um, the blue box is the uh, positive residues. Um, and the red box are the negative residues. There was a, overall, there was a net transfer in quarter four of uh, three, 3,389 uh, gigawatt hours. And that's a 10% increase compared to uh, the corresponding time in, in 2022. A bit more detail. Um, with this curve on the right, um, just shows the Victoria New South Wales Interconnector uh, Export Limited uh, limit. Uh, it actually turned negative during the daylight hours, and that's that's due to a number of factors. There's some some uh, some weak um, some some relatively weak transmission lines. Uh, in the uh, border between Victoria and, and New South Wales, um, in the Yas to Yas to, Wag Yas to uh, Wagga area, and also some uh, voltage stability uh, issues, constraints in the uh, uh, Barolan to uh, Darlington Point area, uh, which contributed to uh, those limits uh, being applied during the middle of the day. Um, at, 
because of that, we're, we're seeing some price separation uh, between New South Wales and Victoria. So you see the New South Wales uh, price curve on the bottom. Um, it splits from Victoria uh, quite noticeably, especially during the daylight hours, uh, as shown by that curve uh, on the bottom of the, uh, the graph. In terms of uh, FCAS um, outcomes, so total FCAS costs for the quarter was uh, 33 million, uh, which was a 6 million reduction compared to quarter three, 2023, and a significant reduction of 64 million compared to uh, quarter four, 2022, uh, where in 2022, there were some um, really high FCAS costs due to uh, transmission events uh, affecting the uh, South Australian and Tasmanian regions. So we ha we actually had two new uh, FCAS markets uh, commence uh, in the NEM. They were one second very fast um, frequency contingency services. And um, you can see from this curve on the bottom, um, some of the um, pricing outcomes uh, for that one second service. So what we're seeing is um, in terms of who's providing the FCAS, um, it's dominated by uh, batteries at, at 50%, followed by uh, the more traditional um, service providers, uh, including demand response, uh, which um, which uh, had 12% market share. The curve on the bottom um, just shows um, which technologies are providing the one second service. And you can see there uh, battery, battery and uh, demand response and uh, virtual power plants of the three technologies providing that very quick uh, contingency service. <clears throat> okay, I'll move on to uh, gas market dynamics. So we ha you had East Coast gas prices uh, and demand. So the um, qu quarter four uh, pricing outcome for the declared wholesale gas market in Victoria was around $10.80 per gigajoule. Uh, and in the uh, Brisbane uh, short-term market, it was uh, similar, around about the uh, $10.70 per, uh, per gigajoule. Those price outcomes um, were a lot less than what the ACCC LNG net back price had anticipated. Um, in terms of gas demand, uh, overall demand uh, increase relative to quarter four 2022. And that was uh, pr primarily driven by uh, LNG Queensland demand uh, as seen by this uh, teardrop diagram on the right. You can see, you can see demand uh, of um, 25 uh, picojoules uh, from Queensland LNG uh, compared to uh, commercial, industrial, and residential demand dropping by uh, 11 picojoules and gas generation decreasing by one picojoule. In terms of uh, Victorian exports, uh, they continue to decline uh, relative to what we've seen in the past. So that's clearly, clearly visible uh, by this, um, these bar charts on the uh, on the left. And for the first time, uh, the uh, Willoughby Creek output in terms of um, gas uh, surpassed the Longford uh, gas fills. So you can see here, um, Longford gas uh, produce about 215 
uh, Pegajules for the quarter compared to the Willoughby one, um, which surpassed it, producing about uh, 235 uh, PJs. I'll talk more about uh, Lofford Gas. So this this is uh, Longford uh, Longford uh, production for qu quarter four, and this is sourced from the Gas Bulletin Board, uh, which has been operational since um, July uh, 2008. So it's the second lowest uh, Longford gas output, as, as shown by this bar chart. Uh, only 2014 output was lower. Now, Longford gas production is, is influenced, of course, by the Bass Strait uh, gas fields. And, uh, you know, there's been de declining reserves in Bass Strait for a number of years. Um, so that's why you're seeing this uh, general trend in um, declining uh, Longford gas output. Um, in terms of the chart on the right, it just shows the actual production uh, from from Longford, um, and it's pretty clear from that that trend uh, that uh, actual production is 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 decreasing. So the daily production at Longford. You're looking at about uh, 400 uh, tigerjoules uh, for last quarter, compared to around 800 uh, TJs. Um, um, and this profile is uh, across a number of years, and you can see the trend. The, the, the trend is very clear. So that's. That's it for the presentation, uh, uh, Slayman. So uh, happy, happy to take uh, questions. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Kevin, for for the updates. Uh, we've got a few questions coming in. Uh, the first one is from Damon uh, again. Uh, he's asking why is black coal? So this is I I believe it was slide thirteen. Correct me if I'm wrong, Damon. Why is the black coal generation declining despite the underlying demand? Uh, increasing in afternoon and evening. So in in during times where solar is is not uh, basically available, and it shows. I think your first chart showed an, an overall increase in underlying demand, uh, and you noted that wind is increasing only twelve percent. So it's surprising that black hole is able to um, reduce despite rising underlying demand. So the question is how how is coal uh, black coal generation declining? Yeah, um, I have to revisit all the figures um, because, yeah, he's right. In in, in the evening, um, grid grid scale solar uh, would be declining, but then you have um, gas for those particular hours may increase its output, and then we had a chart earlier where. Um, Hydro output stayed fairly, uh, fairly constant. But uh, in terms of that distribution, um, you, ha you have to look at numbers. But the um, hydro may, in fact, it uh, in fact increase its output um, during that um, period from six pm to to ten pm. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Kevin. Another question from Shaz. Uh, question is: Counter price uh, follows uh, flows on the VNI are getting out of hand. Am I reading the charts correctly? Uh, that Victoria has negative intra-regional uh, settlement um, residue. Oh, I I I R S R. Yeah, that's that's correct. Um, so. Um... As I mentioned, there's um, that area of the network is relatively weak. So you've got uh, a number of constraints. You've got uh, four key thermal constraints. And uh, those thermal constraints are to avoid the overload of the 132 kV Wagga to Yass 
uh, lines uh, for a trip of the logger to lower tumut line. And then you have a couple of voltage stability constraints, um, which limits the transfer from uh, Barolan to Dallinson Point um, to avoid voltage collapse of the Barolan um, in the event of a 220 kV line trip in Northwest Victoria. So you have these four constraints and um, um, what it means is that area of the network is, is quite weak. Um, and um, when it's weak, the uh, transfer limits are lowered. And then on top of that, you've got uh, prices in New South Wales uh, being higher than prices in Victoria. So you have generators uh, who are receiving the New South Wales price. They are incentivized to generate more and when they generate more uh, with those weak um, uh, transmission um, limits, you get uh, counter price uh, outcomes. So yeah, that's that's symbolic of the fact that two things, you've got weak um, transmission uh, lines in those areas, and then um, you've got uh, regional pricing outcomes, which drives certain behaviors uh, that results in counter price flows. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Uh, Gabriela is asking, can you explain why during high uh, prices in Queensland, volatility and high prices, um, so during high QLD price volatility and high prices, energy is still flowing to New South Wales rather than the other way around? I think, yeah, this is, this is it, yeah. Yeah, look, I'm sure there'll be uh, like, like an instance of that happening. Um, these, the, the, the interregional transfers, uh, which are shown, uh, are basically the, the average numbers. So, um, you know, the, the market's uh, very, very complicated. Um, the dispatches every five minutes. So, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you'll be able to find a a five minute dispatch period uh, with with the outcome that uh, that person has uh, has described. But the figures I've shown in slide 18 are, are for average outcomes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, Jay is asking, I think you mentioned overall hydro output except Queensland. Uh, so these hydro outputs decreased for all times of the day. So what drives this outcome? versus coal slash gas reductions that more closely mirror the duck curve? Sorry, Slay, um, can you repeat that question again, please? Uh, yeah, so uh, Jay is asking, uh, you mentioned overall hydro output decreasing for all times of the day. So what drives this outcome uh, versus coal slash gas reductions that more closely mirror the duck curve? So what, what is driving the, 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 uh, the, the sort of overall hydro output decreasing for all times of the day. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to say, uh, as, as I mentioned, the different hydro assets uh, across the NEM uh, vary. So you have Hydro Tasmania with primarily uh, run the river type generation. Um, you've got Snowy Hydro with some large storage um, so they they don't they don't need to to generate if the prices aren't uh, aren't worth it. Um, and then you've got um, Queensland with um, primarily run the river type uh, type type uh, assets. So yeah, it it just depends on um, what those drivers are for those individual businesses, um, but. Uh, as we showed earlier, overall prices uh, were driven lower because you had uh, lower uh, uh, input fuel costs from uh, from from uh, coal, and you had lower uh, input costs from from gas, and then coupled with the fact that um, you know uh, VRE generation has increased uh, from wind and solar, all those factors mean um 
um, hydro uh, probably reduced its output because it wasn't worth uh, value for them generating at that time uh, because the prices um, weren't quite as good as what they could get if they generated at a later period. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, another question from Robin. Uh, Robin is asking, what prices do black coal and gas become uneconomic uh, and eventually close? Um, look, that's that's a really good question. Um, those generators um, are slightly different. Uh, you know, they have to cover fixed costs and cover variable costs. Um, and then, you know, you've got factors like uh, whether they have long-term contracts with um, with counterparties. So um, if they can have, if, if they can secure contracts, then it, it somewhat uh, insulates them from uh, what the wholesale prices uh, are doing. But if they can't get, um, a counterparty to agree on, on a contract, then uh, they'll be exposed to, to what the wholesale prices are. So it's a hard question to answer. Um, uh, it varies quarter by quarter. Um, as I mentioned, um, quarter four, 2022, prices were double uh, what they were uh, in quarter four. Um, so, you know, uh, those generators that uh, stay around um, can um, can earn a reasonable return. Um, so they'll just have to look forward uh, in terms of what the likely generation mix is for the NEM moving forward, and then they'll they'll need to, like I say, uh, work out what their costs are, work out if they can. Um, hedge some of their costs with counterparty contracts and then if they can't then they, ha they have to work out what the likely wholesale forward price is because that's that's what they'll be earning uh, from from the spot market so they, they need to do all that uh, in their de decision making process as to how long uh, they remain running Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Uh, Liam is asking, given Victoria is an e exporter of electricity to Tasmania under the current scenario, would the introduction of Marinus Link have any impact on the NEM? So is it is it clear how much additional Tasmania generation would be required to ensure Tasmania is an e exporter to Victoria? That's, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, there's 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 a lot of facets, um, a lot of considerations uh, in terms of what what the likely or forecast outcome might be. So um, we we don't forecast ahead. Um, so it really depends on what what the um, generation mix is in Victoria versus the generation mix in Tasmania. Um, you know, it depends on uh, inter interconnector flows uh, out from Victoria because you've got the Haywood inter interconnector going to uh, South Australia and then you've got the uh, the Victoria New South Wales inter interconnector going into New South Wales. And then on top of that, you know, you've got the Project, uh, Project Energy Connect uh, stage one um, between South Australia and New South Wales. So all those factors... Uh, would have to be considered in terms of what is the dynamic when Maris, Marinus Link is commissioned. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, question from Rodney. Uh, if the export constraint is around Wagga, why doesn't EMA open up the interconnection to Wagga between Victoria and New South Wales to force more power through the Deterring inter interconnection, so to allow greater exports from Victoria to New South Wales. Yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned the Wagga to Yass, um, but of course, there's there's also um, the next binding constraints, uh, which are 
you know, constraints between Datarang and Murray. So it's not simply a case of, um, you know, just opening up um, transfers on one part of the network and that opening up uh, in isolation won't affect uh, transfers in a close proximity. That's not the case. So, yeah, um, that, that explains why you can't just simply, you know, increase the tap on one area without impacting somewhere else. Yeah, thanks. Thanks again, Kevin. So Perry uh, is asking, FCAS markets had lowest costs over the last eight quarters. Is this a general trend going back further or is it is it, is it the lowest cost ever or is it a general trend going back further? Yeah, it's uh, we show the 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 trend um, going back as far as uh, uh, 20, 2021. Um, yeah, well, I'm not sure uh, if it's the lowest ever. Um, I just don't have those stats with me. Yep, yep. So Robin is asking, when will the transmission line upgrades occur and would this have a substantial impact on the maximum prices? Yeah, um, as, as I mentioned, um, Project Energy Connect um, uh, is, is proceeding to implementation. So um, um, understand stage one is uh, releasing about 150 megawatts. Um, so I'm not sure about the exact timing of that. Um, and then stage two uh, will be a few years after that. Um, I'm not sure where VNI West is currently at, but you know that's that's uh, that's in the Red T uh, process. Um, and then you you've got the um, um, you've got the interconnector um, also from um, uh, Humlink also uh, that's also in the uh, regulatory investment test process. So look, all those interconnectors, and then the, someone mentioned Marin's Link also. So all those interconnectors. Um, uh, would play a role in the efficient sharing of of uh, energy and and transfers, uh, but um, exactly what um, pricing outcomes will result? That's a really difficult question to answer. Um, the proponents of those uh, transmission have attempted to, you know, do a forecast as part of the red tea process, and then of course you got the AER as the regulator um, that scrutinizes the the modeling assumptions yep yep uh we're gonna take one more question uh the question is how will we fill the void in capacity without relying on fossil fuels uh especially when you know electrification plans are escalating and also brown coal fired power plants are slated for retirement in the 2030s yeah um I mean, that's probably um, driven the Commonwealth government to um, step up the volume of, of, uh, of uh, government uh, assistance through the capacity incentive scheme. So I think the figure is about like 32 uh, gigawatts of, of generation by, by, by 2030. So I think governments are recognising that um, they need to stimulate um, and encourage, uh, incentivise um, generation to, to come online um, in time for um, potential uh, of thermal generation uh, uh, leaving the market. So that balance will have to be finely tuned um, uh, over the next, you know, six, seven years. 
Yep. Thanks, uh, Kevin. I think we are. Uh, we have reached the end of our webinar. Um, Kevin, thanks again for for the updates for for quarter four of 2023. And thanks everyone for tuning in to this quarterly energy dynamics webinar. And we will see you next time. Uh, sorry for the there were two more questions that we couldn't answer due to you know we went overboard on time. Hopefully you get get the chance to ask these questions some uh, some other day. Thanks okay. everyone. Thank you.